So today I'm going to talk about how to value a book based on its book binding. Uh, now they say you can't judge a book by its cover, uh, but in the antiquarian book world, uh, we know that's a little bit of a lie. I'm in love with this cover, uh, and I call this the unicorn book binding. Um, now, where did I get this book? I bought the book at the Brooklyn Antiquarian uh, Book Fair. Uh, so Joe, if you're watching, <laughs> sorry about that, but I got a bargain. But I'm telling you this uh, because uh, the Brooklyn Antiquarian Book Fair is a wonderful uh, show. It's been increasing in visibility uh, every year. So if you're a book dealer, uh, go exhibit there. It's usually September of every year. If you're a collector, it's a great place to visit. Uh, there are a lot of young, interesting dealers there with a wide variety of material. So it's a very hip, cool fair. Uh, this book is actually uh, printed in 1508. It's what we call a post-incunable. So it's not an incunable, which is really books print up to like 1501, the earliest printed books. Uh, but it continues past that books printed up to 1530, we call post-incunabular. So that's where this fits in. Uh, still a very early book in the style of printing of Incunabula. Uh, the book itself is actually one volume from a set uh, from 1508. It's from a Bible with the commentary of Nicolas de Lyra. Uh, Nicolas de Lyra was a 14th century French uh, textual scholar. Uh, he did a lot of biblical exegesis on the Bible, analysis of the Bible in a very literal way. Uh, and uh, his work was really the first published biblical commentary, but that was in the 1470s. And so this is 30 something years later. It's a little bit late and I've seen a lot of Nicholas de Lyra books. Every time I see a Bible uh, and the Bible is in the center and there's like a rectangular commentary around it. That's almost always what we call the postille of Nicholas de Lyra or the commentaries. Uh, so that is not what appealed to me about the book. Now, uh, the book itself is also a little uh, interesting. It's the Repertorium Alphabeticum. It's the last volume, of, but it's basically an index volume to the other six. So you can go through here and you can choose lines from the Bible. And if you were a, uh, 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 doing a sermon in the 16th century and you wanted to quickly reference a line from the Bible, this would be a helpful book. Uh, why do I say that? That can sound incredibly dull to be like an index volume. But uh, for me, it's almost like a little bit of early information science. It's like you can use this volume to basically do a, a Google search on the Bible. Uh, so from that modern perspective, it's interesting for data science or information science. But uh, why did I buy this book, a single volume from the set? Well, what appealed to me uh, was the book binding. Now, I stress that because when you're going out to look at books at book fairs, uh, you can often hone in on one thing in which you have particular expertise, so which you have a particular passion for, uh, which somebody may not have given uh, their full attention to. Uh, so uh, while the bookseller only charged me $300 for this because it's a single volume from a set and usually incomplete things, uh, even when they're early printed, do not have a lot of value, uh, I don't think he paid as much attention as I did to the binding. Uh, what is fabulous about this binding is that there is a lot of what we call blind stamping on the binding. That's when they took in the 16th century, uh, they took a pigskin binding like this. This may be a German pigskin binding. And they took blind rolls and they put animal figures and sometimes they even stamped uh, you know, portraits into the binding. Uh, that is typical for its age and style and location. Uh, what appealed to me particularly about this binding, however, is that it is covered with unicorns uh, and just unicorns mostly in the center panel. I haven't really, I've seen a lot of early book bindings and I haven't seen one that's really covered uh, with unicorns, uh, which seemed to me very unusual. Um, now, of course, unicorns are famous, uh, 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 medieval, <laughs> famous creature of a great importance in the medieval period. You can go to the cloisters, see the unicorn tapestries. Uh, a lot of printers employed unicorns. They have, for instance, uh, what we call a printer's emblem on a lot of title pages of old books. That was the mark of identification of the printer. Uh, and there are printers, especially in like the 16th century in Paris, 
uh, like uh, Thielmann Curver. He was a printer who actually had his shop at the sign of the unicorn. So his printer's emblem has two beautiful unicorns on it. Uh, but I did not see so many uh, uh, unicorns on a binding. So uh, that is what appealed to me. Now I've done some binding research in their databases online. Uh, places like the British Library has a wonderful uh, pictorial database of book bindings one can go through. Uh, I did not see an exact comparable for this. So I still have to do some research on this to see if I can find uh, which binders use these particular tools. Uh, and there's a large number of references devoted just to book binding. So it's a fascinating field in and of itself. So what would I place, uh, what value would I place on a book like this? Well, I would agree with the seller that if this was just a single volume from the set, $300 is not an inappropriate price. Of course, it's a bargain when you think uh, what you can get for $300 that you could even buy an early book. That's why I say early books are incredibly underpriced uh, and well worth collecting because uh, they're such fascinating objects of history. Uh, but now that I've spent uh, so much time looking at the binding and I had such a passion for it, I think I can convey that to other people in terms of its rarity and its being unusual. And I'd probably place a retail price in this of about $1,500. Now, uh, pricing is a little bit of an art as much as a science. There's no other direct comparable. I can say there's another unicorn binding that sold for $1,200. This is the one and only. Uh, that I can find. So somebody has to share that passion and maybe they'll step up to the plate and buy it. Uh, the reason I'm telling you uh, the uh, where I bought it, how much I paid, and what I possibly could sell it for is because I want to underscore the, all the different aspects of a book which could be interesting or appeal to somebody. In this case, I focused on the book binding, but you don't have to focus on the binding. You could focus on a particular passage in a text that would be unusual. You could find a printer and realize it was a woman printer. You could look uh, at the provenance of the book and see previous ownership that was particularly intriguing. So there are all these different aspects uh, of a book that uh, can you know, excite and appeal to particular people and increase the value. That is the added value uh, that we try and put in as booksellers. But also, of course, if you're a collector, you don't have to sell the books. Uh, that is part of the enjoyment. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for watching. And please uh, make sure you subscribe. And I will try and share uh, some other secrets of the antiquarian trade and tips uh, and the joy and fun of books.